texting, right? So our head weighs 10 to 12 pounds if we put it on top of the rest of our body. If we angle 30 degrees down, our head then weighs 40 pounds. If we're really into our text and we're down at 60, then that head's going to weigh 60 pounds. And so imagine what force that is putting on your back and what force that's putting on your pelvis. And so Nanny's going to get into how much it matters, like all the kind of questions we ask, but that head position matters to us. Uh, I'll talk about Dr. Yonda, who um, is an amazing, uh, was an amazing guy kind of before his time. He died in 2002. He had uh, polio. He recovered, and then he had post polio. But he was a physician who really believed in the physical therapy aspect of things. And his take was, I mean, he really, before his time, right, that muscle imbalance in today's society, coupled with stress, fatigue, the fact that we do the same thing all the time, are that we lack variety. So the people who train to be swimmers, the people who train to be runners, the people who train for a particular sport, we need variety. And so it's a bigger issue now than it was when he made the statement. So true core muscles are the diaphragm, um, the pelvic floor, which you really came to hear about, uh, the deep belly, uh, it's not to the six pack or activate your core. The superficial muscles, that's not your real core. You'll get to see a little bit of that. And then the deep back muscles, called the multifidi. And it saddens me greatly, but we're not going to talk about the diaphragm too much or the multifidi, but we'll talk about the pelvic floor, the deep belly a little bit more. But if you look at the picture to the right, that person clearly has some really great abs, but notice that they still look pretty rectangular. So. That's good core strategy, okay? All right, so we'll look at the pelvic floor. The thing to notice uh, for the male and the female, the anatomy is really pretty similar. So if you look at the top two pictures, the only difference in terms of muscle structure, I guess not the only, but the main difference is the parentheses around the urethra or the vagina is the bulbospongiosis on the female. And that would be on the shaft of a male. But other than that, when we are working with pelvic floor, we're kind of releasing and doing a lot of similar things with the anatomy. Um, the other nice thing to notice is just the alignment of the organs. So for the male, where that bladder's sitting, uh, the prostate kind of light, but where that is and how that colon lines up. On the female, the bladder, the uterus, and the colon. The other nice thing to notice is all that fat there. And that's a really great thing that really protects our pelvic floor. So a lot of people, as they eat females, as they go into menopause, start leaking urine if they never have before. That's because a lot of that fat because we lose our estrogen. And so then we rely on those muscles more. So we'll talk about it, but if you leak when you're young, you're probably gonna leak when you're old. Like you need to take care of it, it's not going away. Uh, the middle picture, this person's facing me. By the way, if there's anything that you're really like, what is she talking about? Please just raise your hand, don't let me lose you. But that middle picture, the person will be facing this way. So notice the front part. Well, notice the back part, I guess. So maybe if you'll go to the kind of tailbone. Notice that back region. All of that, all those pictures of the pelvic floor, there's three layers to it. But what you're going to see is we have more muscle structure in the back. And we also, with our postures of today, tend to sit in our hamstrings and in our back. So we tend to get very tight tuck our nerve in our tailbones. Then look at the front for that female. A little bit of pelvic floor, but there's some structure that leaks can happen. Because you're squeezing in the back, you're going to find you're squeezing down, and then all of a sudden that urine loss happens. So one thing that I do when I'm cueing pelvic floor is um, 
um, okay, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but with the pelvic floor, a lot of times people squeeze from their hip external rotators, and they squeeze from that deep pelvis in the back. So what I'll tell people is, visualize that line, the UGT, you with me? Yeah. Um, that's right around the labia. That's sort of the bulbous pudgiosis, that one I mentioned before. Pick up a coffee bean a little bit. Right? <laughs> so, you would be surprised at all of the strong athletes we see, which by the way, I should say, we don't see uh, if an equestrian or a runner or a swimmer gets hurt, we would see that population. But outside of that, UGA has their own therapist for the athletes, so I don't want to misrepresent, but we see a lot of the club sports and all that. So still, we see a lot of really great athletes come through. But if they're coming in with leakage, if they're coming in with pelvic pain, if they're coming in with tailbone pain, we typically start with them with reverse people. So if you've ever read articles that says, hey, it's not a great idea to people, like you may be doing more harm, that would be why. So I'm like, hey, open up. But then I'll say, pick up the coffee bean. And people cannot do it because they lock down deep and they lose track of the outer layer. So again, that's why there's a little specialty on the cause. So Dr. Yonda, back to Dr. Yonda, um, said four matters, okay? So diaphragm, pelvic floor, deep belly, and deep back. That's reflexive stabilization. That stuff should fire automatically. It used to when we were a more active society. But now, just the way we stand, we've sort of lost it. And so a big part of our job is retraining that. Uh, and I should also say, not all public therapists would do this. People kind of have their own take on how they do it, but um, for the people who see CrossFitters or um, the more, certainly UGA, it's like these kids want to be up and moving or these young adults. Um, so we drive this whole pattern a little bit more by the time. So Dr. John is like, hey, people are too tight in their low back. They're too tight right under their, their ribs. So think of particularly like the high school girls or the young freshmen coming in. A lot of times they're really the fit ones, the really fit tight ones, they have a little pooch right here, okay? A kid who hasn't had children who's really fit should not have the pooch. We're going to see it on some pictures. But they're too tight here. They're inhibited through their deep abdominals. So, too tight top left square, too tight in their back. They're quad dominant and their hamstring dominant. So they are squeezing all around that pelvic floor. And basically, a lot of what we see, people are locked in. So we've got to relax them out, open those hips up, and um, get stuff rolling. The really other cool thing about Yonda is he was like, OK, for all this dysfunction that happens at the neck, that happens across the pelvis, the pelvic chain is the key in most of the musculoskeletal dysfunction. <coughs> so yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right, so that's core. So, do you like what you see? <laughs> right? It's like, that's pretty good, right? But, we'll talk, we'll talk about the girl first. Okay. In theory, even though she's got a really, really great body, she's got a little pooch. You saw her from the side. So, she has got her, the top of her six pack, so above the belly button, top six pack in tight. She's got her external oblique coming in and it's tight, but she's loading down. So she's got a little pooch right here. That person would be prone to leakage. Okay? So now let's look at the guy. He's kind of doing the same thing, right? So he's really built above his belly button. He's not so built down here. His six pack isn't as solid. But look at his belly in the middle. That is a diastasis recti. It is a split of the rectus abdominis. It's a split of his six pack. So we'll see another picture. It happens a lot to a lot of women when they get pregnant. Um, but I mean, here's this fit dude who's probably weightlifting, and he is doing it by locking in and driving through the wrong strategy. He needs to drive bottom up. He needs to drive from his pelvis first. Okay, just some other pictures of the college to kind of take that point home. So, Dr. Yon was like, hey, people are inhibited through their glutes. 
their heavy hamstring. And so they also, if you see a lot of power lifters in particular, they have um, little dimpled in butts. A lot of ballet dancers have it. And a lot of dance departments really want them to have it because it looks pretty, but it's very hard on your joints because you're a heavy hamstring, you're heavy in your hip external rotators, and you're not using your glutes. So if you see somebody who has a nice warm butt cheek, they're in their glute. But if you see somebody kind of pinched out and narrow, they're driving the wrong strategy. And again, think back to that female that had that structural opening in the back, that person can leak, right? If you just want to drive a little bit more solid. So top left is hip external rotators. Again, I could go over the nice because it kind of excites me. But um, <laughs> anyway, the main one I'll go to do, do coccygeus. So coccygeus, a lot of people are really tight there. They're tough their tailbone under. Okay, if you're a butt clencher, I'm sorry, if you're a uh, um, jaw clencher, you're probably a butt clencher. Okay, and so that coccygeus is shortened and it is fired up. Okay, so they all tell people. I mean, one we released it. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit, but. Um, it's like have a happy dog tail. Now it doesn't work so well if you don't like animals or like dogs, but think about that dog during a thunderstorm or a dog in trouble. That tail is tucked. Well, that looks pretty uncomfortable. You wouldn't, look, we don't want to be like that, right? So it's like be a lab by the fireplace, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> the other piece of that is that green is the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor is going to go right with it. So there's the beginning of your dysfunction, okay? So maybe it's constipation, maybe it's tailbone pain, maybe it's leakage, maybe you're peeing a lot. Um, those are some of the things. Over to the right, that top muscle, piriformis, becomes the deep, deep red muscle, the piriformis. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. Entree or internus, again, a biggie, hip external rotator, but it's huge in pelvic floor is the blue one. Oh, hard. Yeah. And then coccygeus was my favorite one, the little dog tail one. And that's the yellow one. So that is inside your pelvis. Imagine if those are too tight. The green is still the pelvic floor. All of a sudden, all those organs are pretty congested, right? So, um, and then down to the right, Oh, so a lot, another cue I would use is keep your triangle happy. So tailbone, the sits bones, the bones we sit on. If you don't squeeze those, you're in your glutes. But if you go to an exercise class, they're routinely like, squeeze your glutes, activate your butt. It's like it's the wrong cue. If I'm standing here and I'm not squeezing anything, I've got my trunk lifted, I'm in my glutes. Okay? So down here, the triangle is sits bones to tailbone. It's just a different angle on it. So now we're going to blow that, go to the right, yeah, no, 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 I'm sorry, so that area, that's where we get tight, and it hurts, look at the part of your glute that you're not utilizing, right, and that's your power hooking from your pelvis to that leg, so we like to get people back in their glutes, and then um, you've got to do that to be successful in healthy health. health. Mm -hmm. So what can happen, right? Top left, hernias. Um, bottom left, tailbones hurt. So I treated people in their 70s who injured their tailbone when they were 13, right? Have suffered for years. All they need is a tailbone mode, and they need to know how to untuck that region. So it doesn't have to... It can be an acute injury or it can be a long standing one. We can do a lot of work with that. Again, a jaw clencher is very much, um, there's a lot of correlation with pelvic floor. It's kind of stress, anxiety. The person to the right could be having a baby, but they're not. That's prolapse. So that's an organ that is coming out of the vaginal cavity. So, a lot of times if a female is on the toilet and they are like, gosh, I feel heaviness, and they look down and they see that, they end up in the emergency room because they're like, something is coming out, right? Um, this is a little bit more severe because she's on her back, but she's probably bearing down for the picture. But 
that would be surgery. Um, we can still teach core, but it's too far out. But that's so that's about a grade four or five. I think grade five. Um, but we have grade one. So people who deliver vaginally, you typically are going to end up with like a grade one. A lot of times your gynecologist does not mention it because they don't want you to worry about it. Whenever I get to the gynecologist, I'm like, measure it, measure it. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. But why else sometimes it is pelvic floor heaviness? But again, we have a lot of success with that. That again, that one's surgery, but they still they need to know what they're doing. Or there's a 25% failure rate on those surgeries. Again, a lot of times around your period, there'll be more heaviness, uh, or you'll feel like something's falling out. Uh, another thing is if you're pooping and you feel like it's wanting to come through your vagina, that's a rectum that's kind of shifted forward. And I will tell you, so again, although that's a pretty dramatic picture, uh, I do have prolapse. Uh, I had a C-section baby and a, a VBAC. And I probably, I kind of have a great one too. My bladder's a little saggy and my rectal wall's a little saggy. I can live with it because I'm kind of playing my core. You know, again, it helps if you weigh less because, um, you know, there's not much going on, as much compression down. But I can do that and not injure myself. But again, for somebody who's pulling in here and then pounding that region, you're, you're creating a problem. Or again, that 25% failure rate, that's because did they make sure that person wasn't constipated? You know, uh, I mean, you need you need to not be straining down, right? Sound good? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. All right, 50% chance of showers forever. Okay, if you look really close, they're peeing. Right? Bummer, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was somebody at the Olympics that did that. And I think she ended up doing really well. And all they did was make fun of her that she peed during the Olympics, you know? So, whatever. Um, okay, so an elite athlete. 50, so ballet, volleyball, spiking. The ones who have a lot of stress in the sport. 50% chance that they have urine leakage. So we know they're strong, but they're playing their strategy wrong. They're probably too tight in their pelvis. They're probably too tight in their superficial abs. And we're not taught this, right? So, um, so triathletes. Okay, any triathletes out there? <laughs> well, now you're not gonna raise your hand like you do. Okay. Anyway, there are a lot of triathletes in this town, right? So this, so this was a 311 people, 27, 40, 27 to 40 years old, so 16% um, had urinary incontinence, 37% had stress urinary incontinence, and that's the pound. Urgency, uh, urinary emergency is like, I gotta pee, I gotta pee, it's gone, like a loss. Fecal incontinence, again, really pretty prevalent, 30, uh, really 30%, like, and it can be helped. Uh, and then 5% pelvic organ prolapse. So again, it's not that you can't do these sports if you have it, you just have to know how to play your core. Um, and then 50% chance of showers forever is because, again, if you have it young, you're gonna have it when you're old. Well, yeah, I'm older, you gotta take care of it. Um, oh, can I go back? Go back to the dysfunction. Okay, right there. Okay, I, so I left off the most important one. So look at the girl in the middle. So it's like, oh wow, look at all those problems. I'm glad I don't have that, right? <laughs> but like, look at this girl's posture, right? Like how many people do you see blocking their legs out? Yeah, yeah. right? So again, when people come in, I'm like, hey, and don't block your legs out anymore. And then they're like, okay, <laughs> right? Because then if they come up tall, they don't know how to hold it because they don't know poor, because they don't know how to lift their trunk up, right? So it's like, don't worry about it, just be mindful. If you lock out, just unlock. Don't be hard on yourself, like go easy. Because that's the other thing. People, um, you know, near your shoulder, you might be a little bit bummed, but man, put some pelvic health dysfunction, there's a lot of shame, right? It's like, why me, or what did I do? And so um, we need to drop that, right? It's a body part, it's muscle, it's joint. Um, 
Anyway, so her knees are kicked back. Um, she's in her hamstrings. So she's tucking that tailbone under. She's like a dog in trouble. She has, you can't really see it too well because of her coat, but she's um, anteriorly pelvic, til pelvic tilted. That's going to make her really susceptible to back pain and really loss of core here. She might have stress incontinence or she might be, um, need to heal a lot. Probably has some neck pain. It's hard to see off that scarf, but if you're here, you tend to bring it back up so that we can be up right. So, um, okay. All right, so who needs a public health therapist, right? How all of us, right? Because you need to know how to play core. And, you know, again, in um, Germany and Italy and those areas, particularly for women having children, PT is just standard. You just get referred in. You get to learn how to pull your body back together. But I'm at UTA because I want people to pull their bodies together before that. And if I could get into the middle school and not have parents chasing me, then I would be there. You know, because the earlier the better, right? And she's up. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks, Risa. Guarded, if it's 
September. Um, you know, if you can feel where we are in your pelvis, if you can't tell if we're on the left side of your pelvis or the right side of your, side of your pelvis, that's important to know as well. Um, yeah. So once we've had a good um, evaluation and we have a plan of care and in motion and we have your goals that we've talked about, we would move on to the treatment. Um, so the biggest part of our treatment is going to be patient education, at least for the first couple of sessions. Um, so we want to talk to you guys about anatomy, about posture, gait, um, you know, hydration, diet, um, bowel and bladder, like how often are you going, what changes can you make that would maybe normalize that um, if, if those are abnormal um, findings in your evaluation. Um, again, posture and body mechanics. So if lifting is something that you're doing and you're having either pain with it or if you're, if you're leaking, um, we want to address that. Um, playing to that core strategy like Teresa talked about earlier. Um, meditation is a big thing too. So stress and anxiety play a really big role in your body. And so when you're going and you're anxious or stressed, you, we see a lot of that at UGA, especially on finals. Everyone's just freaking out. And um, your muscles, all your muscles, kind of go into this shortening, and especially it really happens with your pelvic core. There's a lot of people focus on their neck or you know shoulder tension, but you still have that same amount of tension um, down there as well. So that can aggravate symptoms. Um, and then manual therapy. So that would be um, soft tissue mobilization, joint mobilizations, anything like that. So if you've been to PT for your neck and you're just really stiff and your PT works on that, it's kind of the same thing. It's just in your pelvis and around that area. Um, so scar tissue mobilization is a big thing. So any abdominal scars, um, like C-section scars, or if you've had any sort of like an appendectomy or gallbladder removal, we want to know that because that scar tissue can um, kind of form this like web right under your skin really start tightening all of your tissues under there. And that, again, leads to your diaphragm, which is that breathing muscle, not being able to work as well, and then tension through your pelvic floor. Um, and then visceral mobilization is something that's super useful as well. So all your organs are sitting around that area, and sometimes, again, depending on diet or, or scars, those can become adhesed and then um, affect your pelvic floor. Um, and then the, the picture of the, like the animated picture is sort of what it would be like um, in an in internal treatment. So again, we're well, just addressing those muscles. So filling in um, rationally for women, rationally for men, um, feeling for what side's tight, what side's loose, and trying to work on those um, to normalize that tone. Um, that can also, we can also do tailbone mobilizations for that. So if you've had a fall on your tailbone or any sort of trauma like that, um, your tailbone can get a little deviated. And so that can affect um, the way that you're firing those muscles or if you're having pain with sitting or um, if it's really hard for you to move, things like that. So tools that may be used in your sessions. So um, one is dilators. And so that's the picture on, on like number one through eight. And what those do is they just help to gently stretch your tissues. And so um, it's super useful for people who have conditions like vaginismus, which is where you know, your pelvic floor goes into kind of this like reflux of protecting every time there's sort of any sort of exertional activity. So either from trauma or stress or anxiety, um, that's a really common thing. Um, as well as people who have really t a lot of tightness after like cancer treatments and radiation you go into a lot of muscle brain for that, or again, abdominal surgeries or, or major surgeries that can affect um, your abdomen. Biofeedback is something else that's used pretty commonly. Um, that's the picture with the lady pointing to the computer screen. And so what that is, is there are sensors that are placed in and around your pelvis, and so it helps to see if you're contracting the right muscles or relaxing the right muscles. Um, that being said, we don't use that at UGA, um, but a lot of people, kind of associate pelvic health with biofeedback. And you can do pelvic health without it, and it's not necessarily like, you know, the end all be all. Um, so a lot of times people are like, well, like, I don't know if I'm doing the right. And it's like, you, you probably are if you're, you know, you're, you're working on your core, you're getting into other things, and it doesn't just have to be about your pelvic core. Um, and then the Swiss ball. So yoga balls are really good to help 
kind of get that ebb and flow. So when you inhale, your diaphragm should drop down and so should your pelvic floor. And then with the exhale, those should both reflexively come up. And so sometimes it's easier for people to feel that when they're sitting on a yoga ball and um, there's like that bounce back and forth between their pelvic floor and the ball. Um, and then Teresa uses a lot of body equipment as well um, to bring out. Um, so the biggest thing with public health, self-care is a huge thing. Um, we talked about breath being the driver. So again, the diaphragm, you want it to be able to expand and move in all three directions. So we're not just breathing in and out, up and down. You want to be wide, you want to be back and forth, because that's going to drive how your pelvic floor is functioning. Um, hydration, super, super important. So you want to be hydrating um, half, half an ounce per body pound of body weight. Um, and then, so that's depending again on your um, activity level, where you live, your diet, that's kind of a general rule of thumb. And then urinating. Um, you should be going to the bathroom every two to four hours with an eight second um, void. So a lot of times people are going like one hour, or every hour, and you're going with a little dribble. And that's not necessarily normal. Um, and then sit, don't squat. So the big thing with that, with ladies, we'll, we'll hover over the toilet if we're like at a bar or you know, somewhere. And uh, somewhere the bathrooms are gross. And that is not necessarily good for your pelvic floor because when you're hovering, you're activating a whole bunch of other muscles. You're activating your abductors, your glutes, and your pelvic floor isn't able to relax and enter your bladder or bowels fully. And so then you may have to go sooner than, um, you know, sooner than your bladder's actually full. Um, that being said, the squatting potty is awesome. It is, you know, all over social media now. I think it was on Shark Tank. Uh, but what that does is it just brings your knees over your hips, and so that helps relax your pelvic floor so that you can go easier. So pooping is easier, peeing is easier, and avoiding fully. Um, and then again, with pooping, you should be going three times a day or three times a week. So that's a really large range. Again, it depends on diet, uh, you know, your activity level, your age. Um, and then sleeping, getting, you know, seven to eight hours of sleep, and then making sure that your stress levels are under control, especially for a lot of the students um, at YouTube. And then resources. So there is a whole bunch of stuff right now um, online, which is so awesome for people to get this information. Mm -hmm. um, I think the two biggest things from here, it's kind of a busy slide, but the first two, so the American Physical Therapy Association and Herman and Wallace have um, directories of pelvic floor therapists to practice. And so you can type in your area code or, or zip code and like find someone in your area. Um, and so those are really good ones. They also put out blogs. You can sign up for newsletters. They'll mail you every month or something, um, which is good information. Um, and then there's YouTube videos. Um, there's a video on fashion business, which kind of explains a girl's um, you know, journey through that and her, her physical therapy treatment, which is super, I think it's useful for people to see. Um, and then it's exclamation, so on YouTube, just information about um, public health. There's a whole bunch of blogs. Those three, um, I really like Match the Batch, it's actually really funny. It's just like silly little videos that this lady makes about not necessarily just public health, or not just PT, but just women's health in general. Um, and then there's online support groups as well. So if you have dysfunction, um, there's so many people who have it. Just know that you're not alone. And so you can join any of these groups. Um, there's Instagram accounts that now um, give out this information in a fun, like really easily accessible way. Um, and if you guys want any more information, our emails are up there, so you guys can feel free to email us. Um, and I think there's a handout yeah. that um, the UGA library has made. So we can, if you want more information, we will have them out here. Yeah. Well, let's give um, a big.